Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We're so glad you're with us. We have evidence now that our audience is growing. It is growing in every direction, and we're so thrilled to have you as part of the Good News audience. And if you've never watched this program before, we welcome you. And I ask you to just stick with us. If you'd like to get the, the outline to these teachings, we're teaching a section called Heaven and Hell. And I know that's uh, not, maybe not politically correct. You know, heaven is politically correct, but I really felt like I needed to cover some scriptures on the subject of hell because it's just been avoided. It's been ignored. And I'm just concerned that people won't be equipped with the knowledge that they need to make eternal decisions. And if you, you know, if you just look at this, uh, the Bible is the most, uh, the, the, the biggest selling book in the history of the world, and the Bible clearly teaches there's a hell. And it's become almost popular now for religious figures and whatever to, to, to and, and other leaders to avoid or, or deny the existence of hell and just pretend that, you know, everybody's going to, get to the same place. All roads lead to God and all roads lead to heaven. And, and, and my question is, what if they're wrong? What if there is a hell? And what if it is an option? Let's just take the two, the, the, the two positions. Let's say that you're a universalist and your view is everybody's just going to be fine. Everybody's going to be saved. Everybody's going to heaven. And you live your life. I believe there's a hell. Now, what are the fruits of those two beliefs? I don't believe in an angry, evil God that hates people. I don't believe that. I don't live my life in fear. In fact, I'm happy. I'm blessed. I'm striving to, to live for God and to help people. I have fruit in my life, and, and none of it's really based on a fear or dread of hell. I don't feel like I'm hanging over hell you know, by a thread and I could fall in at any moment, and yet I believe in the subject of hell. I just, I think we need to be willing to go there. And let's just assume that there are people who don't believe in it and people who do. What if, what if, what if they're right and there isn't a hell? Have I missed anything in life by believing in hell? I don't think so. I live a full life. I'm happy. I do the things I want to do. I, I've, I stay away from the things that, that, that hurt and that bind, that addict, and I live a free, happy life. I don't feel like I'm cheated at all because I believe in the subject in a real place called hell. On the other hand, what if these people that believe in universalism, what if they're wrong? What if they're wrong? What have they lost? What does that mean? Well, that means that there really is a hell. And let me tell you something. If the universalists are wrong, they are going to hell if they haven't accepted Jesus. If they think that Jesus is not the answer and that He's not the way, these very people that refuse to accept the existence of hell, if I'm right and the Bible's right, they will go there. What a terrible way to end your life. I don't care how popular it is. We ought to have a desire for truth. I want to know how it is. I don't want to stick my head in the sand. I don't want to just ignore reality and hope that everything's going to work out. These things are too important. And I've said this before. If you take the time and effort to get uh, homeowner's insurance to protect your house from a fire and, and protect your car from an accident, why would you not at least take some time, sit down with an expert and talk about your eternal por portfolio? What have I got to expect? What, what have I done for my life after this life? Can anything be done? And what should I do to be ready, not for retirement, but for eternity? That's a great question, isn't it? And if the universalists are right, then it's not going to matter. But if they're wrong, they'll be eternally wrong and, and regret that that the error of their ways forever and ever and ever. You know, I just never was comfortable with that kind of thinking. I, I'm, I'm a realist. I want the truth, even if, it, if it's not convenient, even if it's uncomfortable. I still want to know the truth. 
I'm going to take you through this. My points that I made were, number one, there is a place called hell. Hell is real. And number two, it was created for the devil. It wasn't created for man, although people go there. Hell was created as a place of confinement for the devil and his fallen angels. They're responsible for all the evil in the world. Now, nobody, maybe, maybe somebody, but most people would agree that if there is a devil and if there is a hell, he should go to hell. Most people would agree that the devil ought to go to hell, a place of confinement where he can't kill, steal, and destroy anymore forever and ever. And that's what hell was made for, was to, was to confine the devil and his fallen angels so that they couldn't carry on any more destruction against God's creation. So, that number two, hell was created for the devil. Number three, we as human beings should avoid hell at all costs. Jesus said, if you had to cut off your arm to go to heaven, you should do it. If you had to pluck out your eye to go to heaven, you should do it. You shouldn't let anything stand between you and making a decision for Jesus Christ. Never, ever. And then finally, the point we're on today is, it's the final abode for the wicked. It's going to be the place that the wicked will spend eternity. Separated from God, separated from God's kingdom and God's new creation, the wicked will go there forever and ever and ever and be confined. They won't be allowed to roam the streets of eternity and defile God's new creation. Now, I want to take you to a place in Revelation, the book of Revelation. This is right after, right after the battle of Armageddon. And this is Revelation chapter 19, verse 19. This is right after the battle of Armageddon. And this is when Jesus comes back on a white horse and He destroys the armies of the world that were arrayed against God. There's an army that's going to rise up to fight God. And God's going to win. Jesus is going to destroy this army. And at that time, this is at the end of, of what we call the tribulation. And I'm not going to get into all this. In fact, I have a series called An Encouraging Look at End Time Prophecy. And it'll answer a lot more questions than I can go into in this teaching. It'll help you understand the various end time events. And, and I, I taught this so that anybody that has any different view of end times can still glean something from the teachings because we talk about the different events, the, the, the tribulation, the rapture of the church, the second coming, the millennium, the new heavens and the new earth, the judgment. We talk about all of those events as separate events. So anyway, it's a great teaching and it's available on our website. Um, but this is the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, verse 19. And, and when Jesus comes back, he says, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured. This is the beast in the book of Revelation. And with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, the beast and the false prophet, which you can get more familiar with in the book of Revelation, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And that's why we understand that hell is a place of fire and brimstone. They are literally, the Bible says, they're cast into this lake of fire. That's the final abode of the wicked. It's called Gehenna in, in Greek. It's a place, it's, it's hell, it's the lake of fire, the second death. There's no escape from it. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth to him, of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So that's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus. He's going to cast the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And then there's going to come a, a, a millennium, the millennial age, when Jesus will rule and reign on the earth and Satan is going to be bound. This is in his final abode. Notice this in Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, I've done some studying on this really to prepare for these teachings, and the bottomless pit is not hell, the lake of fire. Those are two separate places. The bottomless pit was a place where fallen angels have been confined and put until they are finally cast into the lake of fire. It's like a separate penitentiary for devils. And, and Satan is going to be put there in the bottomless pit. That's the abyss. 
not Gehenna. They're two different names for two different places. And this is important because this isn't his final abode. The angel uh, came down from heaven having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. That is just fascinating. So hell was created for the devil and his angels. The beast and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. Satan is going to be confined during the millennium. Now the millennial reign is when Jesus comes back. He appears at the battle of Armageddon riding a white horse. He sets up a kingdom on earth. He's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem. This is the, the premillennialist view of end time events. And as I said, I have all that in my teaching on the end times. But there's going to be a thousand year reign of Jesus where people who live through the tribulation, there will be a population of humans that live through the tribulation. Jesus will come. We will get our new bodies. We'll be resurrected at the rapture of the church, the second coming of Jesus, we'll all have our new bodies and we'll rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. And there won't be any devil. He's going to be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. After the thousand years are finished, he's going to be released. And he's going to go right about doing what he did before, deceiving the nations, trying to turn people against God. And which is amazing to me that he was thoroughly and soundly defeated at the Battle of Armageddon. It's not going to be hidden. That, that's going to be news that everyone knows. Jesus, uh, I mean, really came back on, on, to the earth on a white horse, destroyed the, the army and bound the devil a thousand years. And then a thousand years later, he's going to come back and take the population, many of whom were born and raised in, a, in an era of peace where Jesus was the king and the ruler of the world. They've never known evil. They've never known the devil. They've only known good. And Satan's going to come with, the, the key word here is choice, with another choice. You see, it's been necessary for people from the Garden of Eden until the millennium, every generation, every person that's ever born on this planet or created, such as Adam and Eve, have had the opportunity to make a choice. This gets to the root of the question, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? That's not the question. The, the point is that a loving God that's given us a choice can't force everyone into heaven. That wouldn't be right. So he lets people choose. And the devil's out trying to help people. That's Really, that's the struggle that you feel uh, today, in the world today, what's happening is there's just that people are living in the valley of decision. They're being pulled this way and that. Satan is, has got his, his disinformation campaign ramped up and he's trying to deceive people. He's trying to keep people angry and, and distracted and busy, greedy and lustful and, and, and keep them blinded to the truth. And God has made it possible for every single human to make the choice for Jesus and go to heaven. And, and, and if people don't choose that, then they get the alternative. It's always been the matter of choice. In the millennium, these people that were raised under the reign of Jesus will also get an opportunity to make a choice. And Satan is going to be released from that bottomless pit and he's going to go about deceiving again. You know, you'd think the devil after a thousand years in solitary confinement would have considered his ways. I mean, but he's just evil. He belongs in hell. He's just evil through and through. There is no redemption for the devil. There's no redemptive value in the devil. And so he's going to, he's going to go about in this perfect, pristine society where Jesus has ruled for a thousand years, and he's going to gather an army to do what? To fight against God again. Can you imagine this? that people will choose the devil over Jesus. Even though they've only known Jesus, they've only known the goodness of God, they will choose in that day to, to, to sign up with Satan and gather together to fight against God. 
I'll read this to you. In verse uh, 4, it says, I saw thrones and they who sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So that means the saints will rule and reign with Jesus in this millennial kingdom. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, I believe the church is included in the first resurrection. All the Christians who are alive today will be part of this first resurrection, and we will live in the millennium with resurrected bodies. He says this about us, about the people in that day. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. The second death would be being cast into the lake of fire, the eternal uh, abode of the wicked. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. That's us. We are priests. We are already called kings and priests. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus. Jesus lives in us. We have His name. We are the bride of Christ. And so it just, it just uh, you know, fits in with this process that the saints will rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. But notice what happens in verse 7. Now, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And that, that's what I just... I, I mean, can you imagine a day... And this is not heaven. We're talking about the millennium, the millennial reign on this earth. And, and the earth will be as it is now in its present state. Jesus will rule and we will reign with Him and it'll be a perfect society. There won't be crime. There won't be, there, there will be, uh, there won't be devils and demons uh, that are attacking people and tempting people. It'll be an amazing period of a thousand years. And at the end of that time, Satan will begin to draw. I don't know how he could do it. I mean, I don't know how he gets his persuasion. How do you take somebody who's never known anything but good and say, hey, why don't you join up with me and we will fight against God? Well, you know, I would have a few questions such as, what are your credentials? What, what's your resume? Have you ever led, you know, troops into battle before. And he would have to say, well, yes, the Battle of Armageddon. He had a lot of experience. What happened? Well, he was totally defeated. His entire army was wiped out and he was put in prison for a thousand years. And now he's going to do it again. And people are going to say, yes, I'll do it. I want to fight against God. I just don't get that. But that's what's going to happen. In fact, there's going to be so many of them, it says it'll be like the sands on the seashore, there's going to be so many people that are going to gather together to fight against, uh, against God. Now, here's, here's a question for you. you. You have God creating this. In, in fact, after the millennium, He's going to recreate the earth and recreate the universe in righteousness, purity, like in the beginning. What's God supposed to do with these people? They hate Him. They fight him at every opportunity. They've joined with the devil to defeat God. How do you deal with people like that? You, you can't let them into heaven. You can't just act like it didn't happen. These people spit in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want his answer. They don't want the shed blood. They don't want baptism. They don't want the Bible. They don't want God's influence. And they prove it time and again. Say, well, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? Can I ask you a question? What else is He supposed to do? There's nowhere else to send them. They can't go to heaven. They don't want to go to heaven. They want to fight against God. He's, he, he has no other option. As I said, hell was created for the devil and his angels. But if people side with the devil and people make choices along with Satan then there's no other place to put them except where he is. 
And you can forget the fire and the, and the worm and the, and the brimstone. If you could imagine a place, and you can't, where, where people are put forever, and devils are there, and demons are there, and fallen spirits, and the devil himself, and the beast, and the false prophet, they're all there, and there's no way out, and there's no hope of ever escaping. And the presence of God is not there. The love of God is not there. The grace of God has been removed. And there's no chance of ever receiving from God again. That's hell. I, I think the Bible uses all this, this symbolism to just try to help us to understand what a dreadful, horrible, hopeless place this is. But if you could take a prison and put people there not for a life sentence, but for an eternity sentence, and take out the hope of ever seeing God. Forget your friends and, 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 your, and your relatives. You have no more contact with God and His love, no more presence of God, no more hope that you could ever see God. That's hell. But He has no choice. There's just not a place to put these rebellious souls. If you, if, you, if you built another place, let's say he built a medium security prison where there's, you know, like a country club. When you put all these people there and you take away the ability to leave and you put them there forever and there's no more hope and no more love and no more salvation and no more God and no more presence of God, it's hell. No matter where it goes, it's hell. And God didn't make it so these people had to go there. He's done everything He can do to, to, to get them, to keep them from going there. He paid the price. If, if you invited someone into your home and they, and you said, you know what, I, I want you to be like family. Make yourself at home. Use, use our utilities. Use our food. Eat what you want. Just, you know what, just take care of the place. And don't don't destroy anything, and we'll be back in six months. And and I, just enjoy yourself. Treat it like your own. And that person deliberately burned it down. I mean, they burned it down on purpose. Gasoline match, and it went up in smoke. And you came back, and your house is burned to the ground. And they did it on purpose. And you had to pay for the new house. No insurance. You pay for a new house. Would you then invite that same person in and say, you know what, I know that you know you were really mean and you hate me and you want to destroy everything that I own, but just move back in this new house and you know just try to behave yourself. You wouldn't do that in a million years. It's not right. There are certain things, you have to get this, about heaven and hell that we cannot understand on this side. I, I'm trying my best to, to, to describe it, but we see through a glass darkly. Can I just say it this way? I, I know God. I love God. I know the nature of God. When we get to heaven and everything is said and done, guess what? We're all going to agree with God. We're going to say, Lord, you were right. You see, He's the perfect combination of mercy and justice. And that's really what we're talking about here. Does it, is it just mercy unlimited and it doesn't matter what you think or want? Or is there justice involved? Is there a choice? And certainly there's a choice. So who goes and who doesn't? God decides. But He is the combination, the perfect mixture. And what He decides will be right. And those who choose Jesus will go on with God in eternity. And we'll understand. That's why these universalists, they're operating from a limited capacity, to uh, a, a limited knowledge. You can't see everything. You have to trust the Bible. You have to believe if God says there's a hell, there's a hell. And if, people, if He says people go there, they do. And if He says avoid it, you should. And you can't blame God for this because none of this was His fault. He didn't intend for anybody to ever, ever go to hell. But if people end up there, and they will, it's because of their own choice. Jesus paid the price. He shed His blood. He suffered untold agony to redeem the world from sin. And if they turn their nose up at the answer, 
after the price he paid, what is God to do? Can he just say, oh, that's okay. You know what? You're a pretty good guy. I'm going to forget the fact that you burned my house down. I'm going to forget the fact that you rebelled against me and you hate me and that you don't want my answer. And I'm just going to bring you right on in. Folks, that's just not going to happen. But the main thing is when it's all over with, when we're on the other side looking back, we're going to realize a few things. One is the Bible was true. And the other is that God did what was right. He was perfectly merciful and compassionate while at the same time being just and righteous. You just have to leave some of these things in the hands of God and trust that He's going to do the right thing. I hope that helped you today. Some of these things are very uncomfortable to talk about. I haven't thought about them for a long time, but all this talk of universalism and there's no hell, it just stirred me. Somebody's got to speak the truth. So, you know, at least today it was me. I hope you got something out of it. We got more to go. I got one more session on this, and you can get my study notes if you want the whole teaching, but uh, we'll get into this in the next session and talk about some of these things and wrap it up. And then we're going to move on to heaven. I've got some great news to tell you about a place called heaven. So you don't want to miss that. So do your best to be with us on every program. Make this program your daily companion. And I know it'll help you. It'll put something into you that the world maybe has taken out. It'll fill you with faith, build you up, and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So God bless you today. And I'll look for you next time. And until then, may God's best be yours. To order your copy of this series, visit our website, gregfritz.org. Want more good news? Visit our website anytime, gregfritz.org, for more teaching materials. That's gregfritz.org. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Partner with us to tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ. That means there's nothing that you should be worried about. God's power is available to work on any level, on any problem, in any situation. The faithful financial support of our partners enables us to produce the Good News program. We invite you to donate and partner with us today. Learn more at gregfritz.org. To order your copy of Greg's book, visit our website, gregfritz.org. Coming up next on Good News with Greg Fritz. People who don't have Christ will have to give an account before God for every thought, every word, and every action of their life. That is sobering. I, I frankly don't know why people aren't more insistent on, on teaching this and preaching this. We're not doing society a favor if we don't give them all the facts. How can they make a, an informed decision if we don't inform them? They may not like it, and they may disagree with us, but man, oh man, we need to go on record and say, hey, there is a hell to shun. You do not want to stand before God without being forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is an, what a terrible day. Watch Greg Fritz, Monday through Friday on GospelTruth.tv for more good news.